I've spent the past six months looking into the history of prosthetic devices, um, partially into the science behind it and the development and you know what led to the invention of what, but also looking into the social side of things. Uh, how were people's lives affected by this? Now, the outline for tonight, uh, we're going to be moving at a bristling pace, but there's a lot to cover. So we'll be starting out with um, an introduction to myself, inspirations, ancient prostheses, the Civil War, Victorian period, the First and Second World War, and the post-war period. Uh, the Q-Leg, which is a very, very cool uh, little sub-chapter, uh, something that's Queen-specific in the history of prosthetics, even though there's lots of stuff that's still here, especially in um, hip articulations and uh, implants and joints. That's really where Queen's has defined itself. Uh, we also have modern prosthetic development and the ways that it's diversified, and then even moving into um, disability theory, uh, incorporating people who are differently abled and redefining what is abled. Now, why the interest in prosthetics? Science. Fiction. I'm a child of the 90s. I'm a colossal, colossal nerd. <laughs> Uh, and so that really affects things. What I should start off saying is, first off, with the history of prosthetics, it's a field that hasn't been really explored too much. There's a lot to be done. There isn't a lot that's written out there, which means it's very wide open and publishable and, and exciting right now, but it also means that there's not too many sources to work with. So when you do find that one source, you kind of cling to it. Uh, I was asked about the eternal questions kind of with uh, how society understood people with prosthetic devices. Um, what does it mean to have and overcome a disability? Uh, what uh, developments have been made and moved along towards our electronic age? But really, like it says here, prosthetics are all around us. They're in our children's fairy tales, our films, our athletics, our literature, our comic books, and our TV. Uh, whether we've got popular people like Captain Hook Captain Ahab, Luke Skywalker, or the Bionic Woman, or even historical figures like Lord Admiral Nelson, were surrounded by amputees, and more often than not, it's quite a romantic image that's put forward. Uh, since starting this project, I've come across a lot of amputees and prosthetic wearers in the most unlikely and common places. I wasn't expecting it, but they just popped into my life. Um, a girl with a cosmetic doll arm at a wedding who was a bridesmaid, carrying a bouquet down the aisle a man walking on two prosthetic legs through the Toronto Pride Festival this summer, or a gentleman sipping a cup of tea uh, with his double hook hand in a Kingston coffee shop. Now for me, like I said, science fiction, I have to draw it to Ghost in the Shell, which for those of you who aren't unfamiliar is a cult Japanese uh, animation film which is really famous for breaking into North American, uh, North American markets. Uh, it's set in a futuristic Japan, uh, looking into a paramilitary police force which specializes in cyber terrorism and tech crimes. We're looking at a future where electronics and commercialism have fused with prosthetics. There are people who have swapped out body parts uh, for implants that maybe are just connecting them directly to the wireless internet so that they're diving directly into the net and experiencing information on a visual uh, mental level, or you also have people who are swapping out body parts, eyes, arms, legs for prosthetic alternatives. Now in a less common and extreme case within this fictional world that they've created is the full body prosthetic, where someone who's gone through an intense emergency situation has a, well really what's left of their brain stem and their brain put into a completely robotic body. Ethically, there's a lot of problems with this, but really humanity finds a way to transcend the veil of death through a robotic frame and they're perpetually plugged into the internet which causes a lot of unforeseen psychosocial phenomena and there's all kinds of major threats and that's really what the film looks into but you've got body theft and identity theft you've got seizing control of another person's actions actually hacking their personality editing their memories, editing their eyes. You can't have a witness to a crime in a courtroom if they never actually saw it. Or as this image here, there's a man who's holding someone up on very public morning television that there's an image covering his face and everyone who watches it sees that image. They're all simultaneously hacked. Like I said, science fiction really out there, but it's a interesting uh, possibility. If you find social psychology and philosophy stimulating, I really encourage you to check out the Ghost in the Shell film and TV series. Um, 
it's really been quite a uh, quite a impact in film industry actually more than people realize uh, Larry and Andy Wachowski who are the creators of the Matrix series took this to Joel Silver the producer and said we want to do this but in real life Titanic and Avatar director James Cameron called it the first truly adult animation film to reach a level of literary and visual excellence but really we need to hone in on the research so Ghost in the Shell quite out there quite futuristic and maybe we're not ready for someone who's directly plugging into the internet but what about this man? This is Trevor Prado, a 50-year-old man from Wedmore, Somerset, England, who as of last week became the world's first man to have his smartphone embedded into his prosthetic arm. What he did was he, well, he's been an amputee since age three. Uh, he grew up without a left arm. Uh, with his smartphone, he's a catering manager and he needs his smartphone for work and he used to have to balance it on his left arm and that was not only a usage problem, but it was also, also a safety issue. And he found that smartphones are designed more for people who have two hands than one. So he thought maybe it would be a great idea to get it embedded in. Now he approached Apple, ironically, about this. He wanted an iPhone and uh, approached them with the idea, asked if he could get a blank frame that they could make a plaster cast and make this. And Apple actually turned him down. So instead, he went to his original mobile provider, which is O2 and Nokia. They were willing totally able to work with him. So uh, he worked with the, I think it was the Exeter Mobility Center to have a plaster cast made, they got the arm set up, and now he can use it hooked up to his arm or he can pop it out. And he says it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that's helped his life in so many ways. He can text now, holding his left arm up in front of him. He can pop the phone out and talk on it with his right hand, or he can just hold his left hand right up to his ear. Now some people might think that's a little bit crazy and far-fetched, but for this man and for a lot of one-limbed people, it becomes a, a safety and a usage issue. But how do we get here from these very old and some people might think medieval limbs to, or ones that look like zombie parts at the bottom, <laughs> to these very modern uh, limbs that have become so specialized for very specific functions, whether it's running or, in this case, design and fashion. There's a very brief history with prosthetics. Um, I won't read all of the material here. Don't worry. Don't feel like you have to keep up with it. But it really starts with the Stone Age, uh, even though it is hard to peg when things come down to it. The first sign of anything involving amputation is a Neanderthal man who had his right upper arm amputated, uh, 45,000 years old, and really their sign of at uh, atrophy there. The stump had not only grown to maturity, but it actually shrunk. Now, there's proof here that not only were people amputating and keeping people alive, quite possibly because they felt they had survival skills to keep around, but also there are signs that this man thrived. He lived to the ripe old age of 40 by forensic analysis. In India, the Rig Veda, which dates back between uh, 3500 and 1800 BC, there's Queen Vishpala, who had her leg amputated in uh, the night of Kala's battle and yet was outfitted with an iron leg so she could return to lead her troops in war. Now it's very hard to find any other reference to anything amputation or prosthetic within the Rig Veda. That being said, this is the first literary mention of anything about a prosthetic. In Egypt, we have the oldest surviving <coughs> prosthesis. It's a big toe, <laughs> uh, dating back to the 18th dynasty. That's the 15th century BC. It's a wooden hallux that's been very carved in quite high relief and is fashioned onto the foot with a leather band and laces. It was found in the Theban necropolis by an Egyptian and German excavation team. And uh, really prosthetics, this prosthetics <coughs> shows uh, wear from use, but prosthetics then also served a spiritual purpose. Egyptians believed that amputated limbs remained uh, severed from the body within the afterlife. So quite often, uh, according to custom, ablated limbs were buried Dis uh, are buried and then were dug up just to be buried again with the body upon death. This probably dates back to mythology such as the story of Osiris who's murdered by his brother Set. Now since evil siblings are nothing if not thorough, Set decides to not do just simple fratricide but he actually cuts his brother into several pieces and scatters them across the land. His devoted wife Isis gathers the rogue members minus his phallus because that was eaten by a catfish uh, 
And he, she binds them up in linens so that he can be buried again. The gods are very impressed with this. Osiris is reborn and becomes the god of the living dead and the underworld. In Greece, we get the true prosthetics that are maybe seen as something for rehabilitation. Herodotus mentions a Persian soldier who escapes from Greek capture only to escape 30 miles, get caught again, and decapitated. So, poor guy. But uh, in Rome, we actually get validation of Herodotus's claims. There was a copper and wooden transtibial prosthesis that's dug up at Capri, Italy in 1858. Roman lower limb prostheses like this were typically bronze plates enshrouded, uh, enshrouding a wooden core and socket. So there seems to be some proof to that. Also in Rome, we have General Marcus Sergius, who lost his right arm uh, and sustained 22 other battles while leading a legion against Carthage in the Second Punic War. He had his iron hand fashioned in order to hold the shield so that he could return to battle. And he fought four times, actually, with only his left hand, uh, during which two of his horses were stabbed at from underneath him. Ironically, the only honor that was ever barred to General Sergius was the opportunity to become a priest because you had to have two normal hands in order to offer to the gods, which is odd because he actually probably had something to offer. Uh, we also have the knee walker peg leg, which is familiar and popular all throughout history. It pops up all the time quite often because it's simple and it's cheap and can be made from available um, sources, wooden leather. An early example appears here in this uh, mosaic in Gallo-Roman France, and it features a hunter chasing game. Uh, we also have knee walkers being the most popular because they use the existing knee joint as the load bearing point. Uh, very user friendly, very easy to create, and that's why they're so prominent from pirates to otherwise. <laughs> In the Middle Ages, that's where things start to branch out. Now, they're crude, they're heavy, they do form over function. They don't really care how they look, they don't even have to look terribly human, just as much as a hand, but they have to be able to hold something, such as a sword. Now, here we have Teutonic German knight Gotz von Berlichinger, who's a 24-year-old lover of numerous feuds, ransom, and booty, but his right hand was lost when a cannon fire forced his sword actually against himself while he was fighting for Duke Albert IV of Bavaria at the Siege of Landshut. Now, Gotz is an interesting person because he has his iron hand commissioned so that it can have jointed locking fingers and it could firmly hold the weapon. It could also write, hold the card, etc., etc. Uh, he could probably afford this because of the aforementioned booty, but also because uh, he was a man of the upper class. He had the financial means and the time to uh, hire someone, a blacksmith, who could create these con complex spring-loaded mechanisms. Gotz is interesting because he's nicknamed Gotz von Berlichinger mit der Eisner Hand, which translates to Gotz of the Iron Hand. It's really stuck in German psyche, actually, because not only uh, did Goethe in 1772 write a children's feature featuring Gotz, but also Hitler's SS Panzer divisions had a unit named after him, which used the Iron Hand as their symbol. And believe it or not, the Hitler stuff is easier to find photos on Google image search than Gotz himself. But here's what I've found. My favorite being the bottom one, so that he could hold the quill, play cards, direct his horse, sing karaoke, or he could actually hold a weapon. <laughs> of special note, this image down at the bottom right isn't actually Gotz. It was a arm from 1850, circa, from another uh, French knight, actually. But the, the image at the top is schematics of his arm, showing some of the various things that he could do, holding, writing, holding down a piece of paper. Gauss goes on to have quite an infamous life. He was twice outlawed by the Holy Roman Emperor, once for mugging a particularly loaded group of merchants. He pillaged towns, helped lead and later ditch a peasant revolt, slaughtered Turks, fellow Germans, and the French. And when a bishop once demanded his surrender, he thundered back, Erken mich im Arschlecken, which roughly translates to kiss my ass. The phrase became somewhat popular. <laughs> he also did something that was pretty rare for knights of the day. He retired and died of old age in his bed. He always said that he much preferred his iron hand because it rendered more service in the fight than the original flesh ever did. And it probably was because he had one hell of a right hook. Now, the history of amputations is obviously part of the history of prosthetics, um, and it's quite a gruesome history at that. Uh, prosthetic 
development was quite sporadic because why put the time, energy, and money into creating this device that would mimic the human form if the person was just going to die when the barber surgeon showed up to cut their hand off or their leg? Amputation hemostasis was based on classical physicians, Hippocrates, Galen, Celsus, Archigenes, and Heliodorus, but extremity wounds were the, the big paramount area for a barber surgeon. If there was a wound to the trunk or the head, there really wasn't much that you could do, but with an extremity, you could cut it off in the hopes of keeping gangrene or uh, other injuries away. There was also chronic leg ulcers, tumors, and even semi-elective problems like birth deformities that were some of the acceptable causes for amputation. Surgery was disdained by the church and Persian, uh, Persian academic Avicenna. Avicenna was quoted as saying, surgery as a hands-on profession is an inherently inferior and separate branch of medicine. Now the church was against any meddling with the body because it meddled with God's work and they were against anatomical exploration in total. And because they and very popular Persian um, Persian scholars were against it, it really ends up putting a stop on any thought of surgery as something positive. Barber surgeons are held in a lot of disdain, and due to such feelings, uh, middle-aged medical education becomes purely theoretical, and practical treatment of illness and injury is left to the non-academics, which ironically is pretty bad for your care when that's the barbers, the surgeons, and the general quacks. Despite growth in the middle age, European conventions of amputation, they grow to include leprosy and ergotism, uh, surgery continues to be a shunned field. However, with the invention of the cannon and the musket, we get new wounds that are surprising physicians. They don't know how to deal with gunshots. They don't know how to deal with mass trauma. Uh, if anything, gunshots were considered poisonous in the time because of gunpowder poisoning. Surgeons suddenly in the Renaissance start taking an interest principal among them being French military surgeon Ambois Paré. Now Paré is best remembered for his military campaigns. He served in at least ten, and we're talking campaigns that lasted multiple years. This man went everywhere with the French military, but he really came on just as a hanger-on to one officer. Being a surgeon, he had no rank, recognition, or regular pay. In fact, some of his payments included a cask of wine, 50 double ducats and a horse, a diamond, a collection of crowns and half crowns from the ranks, other honorable presents of great value. From the king himself he received 300 crowns and a promise that he would never let him be in want, another diamond, this time from the finger of a duchess, and a soldier once offered a bag of gold to him. Not a lot of job security there, and really still not a respected person other than possibly the people whose lives that he saved, and even then their quality of life was so terrible that how much was he actually helping them? This is in a Europe, uh, Europe of the Renaissance, where political tussles are being acted on a grand military scale. Uh, we're developing towards eight, uh, sorry, 17th century, 18th century absolutism, which is where you know France doesn't like Germany. France wants to take this. France is going to go to war and is going to absolutely obliterate Germany. They're also dealing with brand new weaponry that can kill on a massive scale, which is frankly, wreaking havoc on men's bodies. During the Siege of Turin, Paré ran out of oil. Now, the normal treatment was that gunshots were considered poisonous, and so they were cauterized with burning oil into the wound to keep the gunpowder uh, contamination at bay. Of course, today we realize that, that puts them on the fast track for gangrene, but back then that was the height of medicine. And it turns out that him running out of oil was about the best thing that possibly could have happened. <laughs> He notes immediately improved patient condition, lower infection rates, and the general fact that the guys are staying alive. Um, so maybe he's onto something. He ends up publishing it in his method of treating wounds, and it becomes incredibly popular, and everyone tends to move away from using oils in general. In fact, it's published in six languages, including as far as Japan. As a court surgeon to four kings, as well as Queen Mother Catherine de Medici, Paré becomes quite a powerful man in court, which gives him a lot of time, money, and resources, and he starts to experiment. Back then, these were the absolute cutting edge of technology. Some of the designs stick, some of them don't. 
uh, probably the ones that don't are because they got so complex that they really maybe weren't working too well. But some of his things included an inexpensive knee walker peg leg, which had a socket-like prominence that was strapped onto the residual stump. And this actually stays common up through the 19th century. There's a more sophisticated and costly exoskeletal transfemoral leg, which features a leather socket, a foot with spring-loaded midfoot hinge, and a knee that could be locked for sitting, all of it plated in iron. Cleverly, he also designed a couple hands, such as this one here that had locking mechanisms, but you can see it's really quite complex. So most likely those didn't work as well as the diagram said that they could. Our next one is Verdun, and Verdun is quite an interesting man because in 1696 uh, he creates this incredible leg. He's a Dutch surgeon, but really we don't know much about him other than the leg, and even what we do know about the leg isn't all that much. However, he introduces the first non-locking below knee prosthesis. We've got here a copper socket, which has been wrapped in leather and a solid wooden ankle and foot. There's a leather thigh corset, which the stump is tied around, and there's external hinges here, which bend and allow free motion. Tightly laced, the corset would grip the stump quite snugly, and uh, all the weight bearing would be down onto that socket, and it allows free knee movement. Verdun's model becomes uh, the model for all transtibial prostheses up until the patellar tendon bearing prostheses of Charles Radcliffe and James Fort of Berkeley in 1961. Dr. Fort is quite interesting actually because he was a U of T graduate who went on to teach at UBC, lead several programs which reached international acclaim and after over 40 years of innovation in prosthetic fitting and design he was actually awarded in 2005 an honorary Queen's Doctorate and his research is later one of the many things that lead towards uh, Dr. Durance's work with the Q-Leg and her modular socket program as well. Next up we've got the Anglesey leg. Uh, Will <laughs> Henry William uh, was the Marquis of Anglesey and he fought with Duke Wellington during the Battle of Waterloo and was said to do actually quite well. Unfortunately for the Marquis, one of the last shots took his leg off at the right knee. In lieu of anesthesia, they just gave him a cork to bite. Now, according to anecdote, uh, he was right beside Wellington at the time. When his leg was hit, he said, By God, sir, I've lost my leg, which Wellington replied in his normal, emotionless manner. By God, sir, so you have. <laughs> Not a lot of care there, although it would be nice to know that his leg was buried in France at Waterloo, and then when he died, it was also dug up and returned happily to England. In 1816, Anglesey was fitted with a leg by James Potts of London. It was a wooden shank and socket with a steel knee joint and an articulated foot, which was controlled internally by catgut tendons between the knee and the ankle. So flexion of the knee caused dorsiflexion of the foot, extension caused plantar flexion in the foot. It was nicknamed the clapper leg quite affectionately because of the horrible noise that it made while walking and while stopping. Despite many modifications, though this remained the British standard design up until the First World War. In 1893, it was taken by American worker William Selfo, who worked in one of Potts' factory to America uh, and was later passed off as the American leg. So a little bit of copyright problems there. Now, opinion varied wide, widely on these mechanical legs. Some people thought they were the height of technology and that they were so fantastic, and other people thought that they really weren't good for rough work and that a common wooden peg leg would do. So both for function and for lack of money, the peg leg still remains the most common simple device. But now anesthesia. Anesthesia is the real game changer. While um, while doctors had learned that using ligatures and hemostasis would give you a little bit of wiggle room on the operating table, there was no effective pain management. If anything, a surgeon was rated on how fast they could perform their surgery. A really fast surgeon could do uh, complete amputation in only a matter of minutes. In 1812, no novelist Frances Burney lay down in her Parisian drawing room, put a handkerchief over her face, and went through a mastectomy without anesthesia. She was quoted as saying, the dreadful steel was plunging into the breast, cutting through veins, arteries, flesh, nerves. I needed no injunctions not to restrain my cries. I began a scream that lasted intermittently during the whole time of the incident, and I almost marvel that it rings not still in my, uh, in my ears still. So excruciating the agony. Not only was this a problem of pain, psychological pain to the patient, but we're also looking at a situation where they're screaming, they're thrashing on the table, uh, it becomes a problem for the surgeon. The surgeon is having 
the patient actually get in the way of the procedure. Fortunately, in the 1840s, there's the invention and proliferation of anesthetics, which is a dramatic shift in the experience of pain by the human race, and it allows surgeons to operate for longer periods of time without interference. The American Civil War is really where a lot of this is put to the test. Even still, there's a lot of amputations that take place without any form of anesthesia or even basic ether. Surgeons from the North and the South performed approximately 60,000 amputations during the course of the war, and while it was considered to be the worst possible thing that they could ever do to someone, it kept infection and gangrene at bay, but it was quite often done in short-staffed and unsanitary hospitals. Unfortunately, many of the men who went through amputation uh, would go through one, and then infection would spread out, and they'd have to go up further, and then they'd have to go up further and further, and you have these chumps, stumps that are shrinking further and further and further, and they're developing at this time methods of padding the stumps, but there's so much experimentation, no one's really talking to anyone, or no one thinks that there's one true good way to do an amputation and to uh, pad the stump, that there's a lot of people who come through with stumps that are either too small or inefficiently padded to actually support a prosthetic limb. Surgery manuals uh, suggested that you do it while the patient is still in shock and immediately after the accident, so medics were given no real sense of when to do this, they had no control over it. Uh, patients' chances of survival were dependent on the wound location, again, further away from the body, the higher your chances of surviving are. And this is where the phrase life over limb originates from. But why was the first world, uh, sorry, the Civil War so deadly? It's the mini ball. It was a new type of ammo that was used for accurate breech loading firearms. It was a soft lead bullet which loses shape upon impact during and shatters several inches of bone, normally carrying skin and clothing into the wound and thereby creating so much of an infection that physicians and surgeons had to do everything they possibly could just to keep someone alive afterwards. Due to hasty amputations, many were left with insufficient padding, as I said. However, those who could support a prosthetic limb found that filling those empty sleeves was the biggest priority, and America suddenly is confronted with cities that are filling up with amputees as a common sight. Their veterans are everywhere, and they're maimed, and it becomes a societal problem. As you can see from the two bullets at the top, it's got a hollow design. Once impacting, that flattens out and loses its shape. Now, this image on the left is a bone that has been punched clean through by the bullet. Clearly this gentleman didn't survive, but on the other side, it's, that's a bone, a uh, humerus, not humerus, sorry, a um, femur of a man who ended up surviving, and that's all the uncontrolled bone growth that popped out. That would have been incredibly painful and something that they just weren't equipped to manage at the time. Of note, the United States, back during the Civil War, was one of the world's largest singularly targeted welfare plans, generating sums of money that were massive for their veterans and ex-servicemen, and in fact it was actually outpacing uh, Europe in welfare spending, which is kind of interesting that, you know, 200 years later we've done a full reverse. The pension plan pl promised one free artificial limb to ex-servicemen as well as other things, and it was incredibly biased towards Unionist veterans. In fact, men of the South and Confederacy quite often had to go to charity in order to get any attention while the Union soldiers were given everything they possibly could. That being said, the pension plan was incredibly unsustainable. In fact, it was actually built up from the War of the Revolution. Estimates of disabled veterans needing care were way, way off. More men came and used it than they ever thought would. The artificial limb business was so small that it really just couldn't keep up with production. And bureaucracy needing physician signed documents saying this man needs a prosthetic limb from you slowed the process down so much between patient to doctor, doctor to patient, patient to government that it was months, years, maybe even decades too late for payment. In fact, there's more than one case where it was not the veteran himself but his widow who picked up the money. And then there's a whole whole process of getting that patient switched to the widow. We've got pension systems that are built up not so much on how disabled the person is, but how many children and dependents do they have. Politicians never thought, this is the major problem which I find so hilarious, that when people are injured, they would use pensions. They thought that uh, part of the American republicanism is that you are strong, you are independent, you don't want to rely on the government, and therefore 
you'll just go back to work. No matter how injured you are, you'll be able to find work, and you'll go without pension coverage. Clearly, this wasn't the case. Men flocked in droves to this, and they were so blown away through their estimates that the system was instantly backlogged. Many feared that this would blow over into the rest of U.S. citizenry, and that it would eat away at the American ideals of individual autonomy and economic independence. How would they protect youth who once looked up to these independent and self-respecting old soldiers? Their heroes had suddenly become these maimed gentlemen who needed support. There was no strong force left in the community to keep the rest of uh, society from expecting the same treatment, and it was completely financially untenable. And here's some of the imagery that comes from it. We've got the U.S. Treasury incurring greater and greater costs supporting an aging veteran population, and popular opinion ends up turning these once war heroes into lazy and insatiable bandits, eating the money of the poor and deserving. Now, you can't read this here at the bottom, but it says, The Horn of Plenty, there will be no danger of a surplus issue for the next presidential campaign. So much spending was happening on the part of the U.S. Treasury, and successful statesmen and presidents swayed back and forth on how to deal with the rising costs. But since veterans had such an incredible voting faction, pensions continued to rise. The government hoped that it would be a temporary measure because, ah, the veterans will just die. <laughs> what they didn't expect was that medical science was advancing so much that they were living an additional 20 years. And the system was just amortizing over and over and over again. And the debt was getting huge. And here we've got masculinity in crisis. I mentioned that this lecture is in part about masculinity and disability. This is an era when men from all walks of life are battling against their insecurities. Uh, they believe that wealthy industry, uh, industrialists and financiers are becoming less autonomous with government controls. Middle class white collar men are believing that their jobs are making them go soft. Unemployed men from the depression of 1893 can't support their families, therefore they are less of men. And they're working in horrendously dangerous fields to begin with. For example, the Pittsburgh steel industry was introducing huge wounds to uh, society. For example, 65% of accidents in the region were the results of burns crushing and electrocuted limb loss happening in steel factories and railroads. In 1905, one manufacturer suggested that the growing demand for prosthetics was proportionate to the increasing mileage of railroads. And during the 19th century, there was also diseases like polio, rickets, and congenital tuberculosis, which were causing abnormal limb growth on a scale that isn't comparable to today. So there's a business of legs that pops up between this industrial problem and this war problem. Douglas Bly creates his natural ankle, which is a polished ivory uh, ball sitting within the foot and a vulcanized rubber socket, which allows full range of motion, he claimed. We also have James E. Hanger, which becomes one of the prominent uh, designers. He was, in the first two days of the war, a cannonball tore his 18-year-old's knee off of his body, and he unsuccessfully tried to return to the workforce, but then dissatisfied with his artificial limb, he went on to invent and later become a manufacturer of the superior hanger leg the cannonball went on to become prominently displayed in his parlor. Uh, he claimed that buyers could trust him because it was lightweight, it was wood wrapped in rawhide weighing only 4 pounds 14 ounces and was very durable and quite snug. There were some complaints, again, some people like the mechanization, some people don't. These are complaints that aren't all tied just to hangar but to other businesses as well. However, it is important to see that divide between the two. Uh, he claims that buyers can trust him as well because he's an amputee, because he could rigorously test it, and he also boasted that there would be no chafing, no jarring, no cords, no strings, the best and cheapest artificial leg available. Companies such as these also created distribu distribution catalogs which had all the various models in them, as well as photos of life-changing power of prosthetics before and after things that went from a vulnerable amputee to a very robust gentleman who was doing something quite manly like handling tools or climbing a ladder. Uh, and it also has a testimonial section at the back. The testimonial section becomes quite interesting because we get all these comments like this one at the bottom. I have been no idler even though I am a cripple. It's serving a business angle to get people saying this limb is fantastic and you should buy it. But amputees are creating their own subculture where they're trying to help each other and trying to purchase the best uh, limb possible for themselves. But there's also this moral tinge 
you have to be someone who goes out and makes something of yourself. You have to get the job. You have to get the good limb. Uh, you can't be an idler. Victorian Britain is going through similar things, but without the war, it's more Victorian culture which starts to really clash on this. Uh, lost limb might be a badge of honor in the American South, but it would be an incredible deficiency in Victorian Britain. It's a reality where appearances are your realities, and it's important to hide those deficiencies from the public eye. Limbs need to look and move human. You need to be able to walk right, pose right, dance right, uh, because any of those things could betray a chance of you gaining upward mobili mobility with the upper classes. It was a vicious society under the chandeliers, and limb advertising companies really capitalized on those social fears with their before and after photos. The industrialism and the rising middle class eroded traditional means by which individuals defined themselves and recognized each other. A new society was created where appearances and recognition was key. The middle class jealously guarded their new and precarious social status, and society became obsessed with proof. Proof that you could pass through elaborate societal rituals, and proof that you could dance, walk right, pose right. If one could pass as a classy and cultured individual, upward mobility was possible. Carved wooden legs, hands, and Indian rubber feet paid artistic attention to detail, but were quite often covered by pant legs, sleeves, or a delicate slipper or glove. So much work put in only to be covered up. Now, in the working world with the blue collar man, business as usual, you need to be able to have a functional limb and you need to be able to have it for cheap. You need to be able to secure work and prove to your employer that you are a good masculine man who can hold down a job, which means that you've got these arms that are blatantly inhuman, the hook hand, uh, the hand that you can screw it out and screw in a hammer or a fork or pliers. Once again, masculinity is being repurposed. The Great War really begins to focus on rehabilitation and re-education, and we have three approaches to it, the British, the Canadian, and the American way, and while they all are slightly similar, they all have distinct differences. In Britain, in 1915, St. Mary's uh, Hospital for the Limbless at Roehampton opens up as an orthopedic hospital, and it specializes in limb fitting and design. It becomes internationally very popular because for the first time, patients, surgeons, limb makers are all coming under one roof, and a collection of artisans are being contacted and contracted from all across the country, most of them British, but Hanger, Rowley, and Carnes are three American companies which come in to teach the British. And we see this competing of national businesses, and it's quite tense. They were all in the same workshop district in the hospital, and there was some friendliness, but there was always a very tense undercurrent that you didn't want that person to figure out how you made your leg work, move in such a way, or how you made this socket fi fit so snugly. Britain was drawn to American mass production ideals, and the government tried to issue a standard leg for cheaper and easier production, but this was met with much protest. The public really couldn't understand that a standard leg didn't mean the same leg for everyone. It didn't mean that everyone was getting the same right leg or the same left leg. It meant that it was a series of easily to make interchangeable parts, but you maybe only had six of those parts to choose from of different sizes and makes that could still be tailor-made and fitted by the prosthetist. They really didn't like the concept of off-the-shelf limbs, and that's why the program failed. But something that was interesting in Britain is there's a lot of experiment with materials. Now, wood and metal, well, wood was the primary thing, but suddenly they're discovering metal. Sertalamid was the first in-between material. It was a mixture of mucilin, glue, and cellu celluloid, and it's no more sophisticated than paper mache but it receives huge government investigation, and while it failed, it foreshadows a future of experimental material science tied to prosthetics. Duralumin, and I always say that name wrong, <laughs> Duralumin is an aluminum alloy which is lighter and stronger than aluminum, and it was at first used in airplanes. Prosthetics draws some of its history back to the aeronautical industry. Uh, aeronautical engineer Charles de Souter replaced his brother's leg, which was lost in a flying accident, and come 1912, they get a government contract because the government realizes that a metal leg not only is lighter and more durable, but it is also cheaper and easier to make. They make an absolute killing, and that kind of affects where limb development goes to. This slide, we've got the three different uh, leg designs. There's wooden down on the, the right. Up top, we've got one of the metal legs. 
and off to the left there is a metal leg which has a sertalamid socket. Sertalamid was known to be quite durable. Uh, it just never really seemed to perform in comparison to the metal legs. Canada ends up moving towards uh, not a contracted business, but a government-owned business. Government proprietorship was thought to be the best way to keep in touch and implement the most up-to-date designs and treatments. All these companies were far too small. The government just absorbed them all and turned it so that everything was printed with made by the government of Canada on it. The government argued for the standard limb, and they won. They ended up creating uh, facility renewals and replacements that could be taking place across a massive country. Patients were fitted originally in the Dominion Orthopedic Hospital in Toronto and then were discharged. There were branch depots in Halifax, St. John, Montreal, Ottawa, London, Winnipeg, Regina, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Victoria. Standard parts were assembled in Toronto and then shipped to the depots if you ever had a repair in need. And the brilliant thing about the standard leg or standard limb in general is that it's significantly cheaper. A leg went for $71.57 versus 120 for a commercial arm, and it costs $77.56 for a commercial arm, sorry, leg. The government of Canada also led re-education movements, uh, which became a big international hit. They saw that these patients couldn't return to being railroad workers or otherwise, so maybe they had to find a different area. Maybe they couldn't be out there setting down rail lines, but they could be a conductor. They end up uh, setting up this massive re-education program, which becomes incredibly popular across Britain and America, and many amputees we see across history end up actually becoming limb designers and fitters themselves. At the bottom, there's some of those interchangeable tools that you can see. Up top is a limb fitting uh, workshop in Toronto and off to the right actually is a Hungarian poster that I saw while I was traveling through the country a couple months ago and very inhuman arms that are popping up but still very robustly nationalist you've got this masculine arm and you can be a good citizen and you can go plow the fields in America they see Canadian re-education uh, re as a new shining way to go. Civil War re-education was incredibly expensive and impractical. Why would men need to learn stuff like basket weaving if it really wasn't going to get them anywhere? They needed to revamp things. So the government ends up surveying industrialists, asking how many disabled they were willing to employ. And quite patriotically, the employers and factory owners willingly respond back and say they would love to hire them. And This is how many men that their facility could hold. They just don't know what to do with them. How willing they were? bit difficult to ascertain. Not sure if this is straight up patriotism or if there was an actual willingness to deal with these gentlemen. Uh, but the government did make re-education mandatory. Men had to go through physio and training in order to be discharged. And masculinity was both challenged and bolstered at hospitals such as Walter Reed. Most of the physio staff were female and prescribed to tough love approaches, giving men back their feet and getting them back on their feet. One needed a positive attitude and challenged the physio nurse at his peril. And I really have to say, after having a nurse for a mother, they have my fullest sympathies. <laughs> These women were frighteningly positive. The conclusion really is Britain, Canada, and America set up these distinct, uh, distinct re-education and business models, which really kind of carries over for a while. But moving on to World War II, this is where things really get interesting. For Victorian Ameri uh, victorious Americans who had grown up in the generational gap of interwar periods, the disabled body was managed safely out of the public eye in the convalescent hospitals and on the factory floor. The massive influx of disabled veterans into daily life after the Second World War was extremely di distressing to them. America was being invaded by homegrown men with alien bodies. Who would protect the able-bodied uh, people from their sense of self? True, the amputee invasion was a logistical and societal nightmare. Uh, but it required a significant restructuring of services, and yet, because of the Civil War, America was really the country that was best set up to deal with uh, mass rehabilitation. They could rebuild their men, they could make them faster and stronger, they could provide the re-education, they could help society forget the trauma of the war, and they could forget the wounded. And for all the hell and heaven that comes with that, it's exactly what they did. 
Two things typify post-war America, and that is extreme patriotism and extreme social exclusion. Absorbed into a victory culture, many thought that victory and superior fighting power in American military life meant that they had cultural superiority. Not only did they have to assert their dominant ideals, but they also had to watch it for threats. David Serlin, who became an indispensable author for me during this research, said that in the late 1940s and early 50s, medical procedures used to rehabilitate or alter the human body enabled the new alignment of civic goals and national imperatives, of material form and ideology, of private possibility and public responsibility. Certain procedures and technologies, such as prosthetic devices, plastic surgery, hormone treatments, and sex reassignment, were appropriated by rhetorical Americanism, which was configured to a particular form of hypernationalism. The first threat, obviously, to this superior American lifestyle is communism. It's always going to be communism. But there's other threats that they perceive out there, the first amongst them being homosexuality, the poor, and immigrants. In order to fight them off, everyone had to be the same ideal American. But the problem with this thinking is that America is populated by individual people with individual lives and individual ideals, which also is something that the country is built up upon. If anything, they were trying to battle communism by acting a little bit communist. Uh, <laughs> now, these very personal uh, ideals strain against the moral streamlining of the all-new, all-righteous United States. However, some Americans used medicine to change their bodies to align with that national narrative. Changing their bodies changed the story that their bodies told, and it changed the stories that it told about their per uh, personalities and proved their Americanness. They could be the self-made man, the cultured man. They could change their body to prove that they were incredibly American. Whether this meant going out and getting a prosthetic leg or a nose job, same thing. While Serlin references uh, well-known facts that medical historians and sociologists, oh, sorry, that doctors, uh, medical historians and sociologists have known for years, doctors have massive authority and respect in society, but quite often people forget that they can have biases. Often doctors give their professional opinion on non-medical matters, and the public just gobbles it up. During the 1940s and 50s, that power was both used and abused to define what was unhealthy and therefore what was healthy. Victims were shunned to the fringe of society, the disabled and the homosexual first amongst them. And here we've got masculinity in crisis again. The Depression, there were few men in the workforce, but after World War I, there's practically no men in the workforce. They've been replaced entirely by women. Conservative critics perceived that America's masculinity was eroding as the prolonged absence of men had meant that communal and domestic life had changed on the civilian level. Many were displeased. Philip Wiley wrote The Generation of Vipers in 1942, which terms the phrase momism, which is the emasculating effects of aggressive mothers and wives and the behavior of passive sons and husbands as a consequence of a reconfigured, reconfigured general, gender roles. We also see photography in this time showing the male body defined in two ways, either its ability to work or its ability to be overtly heterosexual and masculine. Physicists, therapists, psychologists, and ordinary citizens alike regarded amputee men as the physical proof of emasculation. Social policy advocates advised families and therapists to apply positive psychological approaches to rehabilitate them, but such approaches were often geared more to make the able-bodied people feel more secure in their biases, and not so much to deal with the disabled. The disabled were repeatedly told, it's okay that you're inadequate, we'll take care of you, don't stress yourself. Not only did this make amputees feel dependent and impotent, it also led to society where, to a society, seeing themselves as incapable of working and functioning as human beings. The disabled became the other. Throughout my research, parallels have been drawn between medical diagnostics of society used to distinguish between disabled and queer bodies and the normal ones. This is both culturally created and exploited by medical authorities. My favorite example being in 1940, the military uh, would conduct medical exams on recruits and army assistant surgeon Thomas Henderson publishes a manual. Now, his account of what is the perfect man is both Hellenistically beautiful, but it is also very, very in detail. Uh, his recommendations reinforce the idea that evidence of masculine competence would be observable on the able-bodied recruit. And he says that the perfect recruit was tolerably just proportioned between the trunk and different members of the body, a countenance expressive of health with a lively eye, skin firm and elastic, limbs muscular, feet arched, 
and of a moderate length, hands rather large than small. He also believed that firm, able bodies achieved a moral perfection that could not be achieved by those underprivileged men with poor constitution. For a di diagnostic model of health based solely on appearances, the American military's doctors described the male body in titillating detail. However, the competence of the military service was also defined by soldiers' ability to evaluate the worthiness of another superior male. Interestingly enough, we've got this incredibly heterosexual society that's being built up on surprisingly homoerotic uh, tendencies. According to David Serlin, evaluation of the male body here is similar to beauty pageants or beautiful baby contests. Yet while men can openly judge those with confidence, physiques of men must be appraised in a sophisticated and science way. It's a quantifiable and unsexy manner in which male inspectors can freely ogle other men without ever being stigmatized because who would want to do that, right? Gross. Medical photography, in fact, becomes something that's acceptably erotic. If amputee photography um, could show men in such incredible detail, then the disability would become the permanent uniform. Since the Civil War, photos of limbless soldiers uh, sat on mantelpieces and contrasted the, uh, the brutal with the genteel. During the Victorian period, limbless bodies were healed with before and after photos showing emasculinity with hypermasculinity. And medical photographers believe that by using objective science and observation, they could replace any of the emasculating effects of the penetrating gaze of the camera and the body's intimate spaces. But they end up hyper, uh, I mean, overcompensating. They show these hyper masculine men doing masculine, manly things, such as reading the paper, smoking, shooting guns, climbing a ladder. And here's a couple examples this is a Civil War man moving from being completely vulnerable to being able to stand with the aid of a cane, and a World War II version. This man is reading the paper, and you can actually see he has pinup girls tattooed on his legs. So he's, he's a very manly man. <laughs> and this other man is lighting a cigarette, but coming across very much like James Dean, both in hair, in the t-shirt, in the rolled up cigarette pack. Reading sp the sports, smoking, objectifying girls, and dancing were all perfectly American things to do. These men proved that they were able and manly by accomplishing them. But here's where things get queer. In the spring of 1945 in Walter Reed Army Hospital, a series of weekly reviews were held to entertain the veterans and had all kinds of acts, big band orchestra, singers, comic vignettes, vaudeville, but by far the most popular act of the season was a group of veteran amputees which called themselves the Amputettes. Dubbed for high kickers on artificial legs, they dressed in Carmen Miranda-inspired drag and danced with rocket-like precision. Mm -hmm. Amputees, especially veterans, who are rarely not the object of humor and very solemn, they found it absolutely hilarious, these camp personas and exaggerated gestures. The veterans and servicemen loved the amputees, but not just because they dressed in drag, an image which clearly doesn't match up with the military, but also from seeing prosthetics usually associated with solemn rehabilitation, peeking out from behind billowy skirts associated with the frivolity of cross-dressing camp. And that is the intriguing bit. Here we have a heterosexual, homosocial environment that is all straight men, willingly dabbling in queer behavior, and it's all being accepted at face value. The excuse wasn't that men wanted to dress pretty, but rather that they wanted to dance. Heterosexual men dance. They go to dances. They dance with women. Don't worry, it's cool. Especially, it was, uh, essentially this is a implicit don't ask, don't tell before don't ask, don't tell was even a twinkle in politicians' eyes. Whether behavior like this was a true display of the secret self these men wanted to display in a safe environment, or it was just fancy dress is really hard to tell, but it certainly seems that provided men stayed within acceptable boundaries, open displays of queer and disabled behavior and bodies would be accept, uh, accepted and even celebrated. And here's a couple photos of the amputates. Beautiful lasses, aren't they? <laughs> this is my favorite. Look at those legs. Daring ladies. <laughs> it's truly sad that in the late 1940s and 50s, people were made to feel isolated by their differences and driven to alter their bodies to conform. Yet there's a silver lining here. By conforming to a socio-sexual norm, Americans reinvented themselves and carved out a gender-diverse niche for themselves. Oh, sure, they completely reinforced the norm. Manly men acting as manly military men. But coloring it with a decidedly queer element. In this case, manly men dressing up as manly women and dancing. 
we move to the post-war period. Uh, there's the Mach knee. World War II uh, German aeronautical engineer Hans Mach was brought to the U.S. to work for the U.S. Air Force, most likely as a spoil of war. Uh, and he was encouraged to design prosthetics in his spare time. In 1953, he develops an ankle control system, which allows both uphill and downhill stability for climbing and descending. And between 1956 to 74, he develops a hydraulic knee for transfemoral amputees. The mock knee is really quite interesting. He was a engineer who worked with hydraulics, pneumatics, and mechanics, and had previously worked on V-1 rockets, ME-262 jet-propelled fighters, remote-controlled missiles, and the first climate-controlled air flight suite. The mock knee is still most widely used, uh, the most widely used knee replacement uh, prosthetic in the world. It's usually the most ideal for affordable knee joints, and it is especially good for someone who leads a robust and active lifestyle. It's an incredibly simple uh, unit compared to other things that are out there. Next up is Henry Dreyfus, who between 1948 to 50 worked for the National Research Council, and he's an interesting man because his work was all over the place as a designer, uh, both in commercial and military fields. He had designed missiles for Chrysler's secret missile plant, uh, program. He had designed ergonomic interiors for tanks, and he had also planned windows displays for Marshall Fields and Macy's. <laughs> now, in 1950s, the goal of prosthetics was to make the worker as productive and efficient as possible, but there's suddenly this feeling that feel and comfort can't be ignored. The non-human hook hand had to be civilized. It had shiny round stainless steel hooks that imitated the curve of fingers and were capable of dexterously uh, defined white collar work. Industrialism and the new assembly lines were forcing men out of factories and into the office, further threatening masculine identity. The class divide between white and blue collar work was embodied in artificial limbs as well. For men in the workplace, well, the physical workplace, it was very much a detachable thing. You could have detachable hands that did different jobs. You could have something that was non-human. However, in the office, while they still stay with a non-human design, it becomes much more subtle and it becomes much more acceptable and a genteel thing. Its appearance now restores atomical function, uh, anatomical function, and confers self-esteem and cultural capital on its wearers. Now here we've got the mock knee, as well as a more modern interpretation. As you can see, it's a contained uh, hydraulic piston, which goes through the joint, and I could try to explain how it works, but that would take a lot of time, and I don't fully understand it because I'm not an engineer myself. The interesting thing here, though, is the Dreyfus hook. Uh, this man is writing his name John, on a piece of paper, and you can see the hook is still very delicately wrapped up in this white business shirt sleeve. This is something that was incredibly presentable in the workplace. The Q leg now is really interesting, and I was very lucky last week to actually meet Dr. Judith Durant, who is one of the uh, Queen's professionals who worked on this. Now, originally, post operative amputees were fitted with a plaster of Paris. Uh, and they were set up with a temporary pylon which would allow them walk, to walk a couple days after surgery. Uh, it really was important to get people up and moving, both for a physical reason as well as a psychological reason for their sense of self. The problem was that young patients could support themselves just fine, but 90% of patients were elderly and were in danger of falling, damaging not only themselves but at the pylon. Also, since circulation is poor, doctors need to very closely monitor the stump, and if it's covered in a plaster of Paris, you're not going to see it. This is kind of where inspiration strikes. Uh, while skiing in Europe, Dr. Durant took a nasty fall and broke her leg, and on the way down the mountain, it was immobilized in an inflatable air splint, which is common today in many emergency, uh, emergency medical uh, equipment, such as ambulances all carry air splints. Further research into air splints got her and her colleagues wondering, was it possible to create an inflatable limb? Getting amputees up and walking was incredibly important, and perhaps this could offer something there. It fused medical and engineering knowledge and created uh, this inflatable prosthetic leg. The team was Dr. Judith Durant, Dr. Hank Wivers, and Jerry Saunders. The leg was a series of plastic envelopes with three internal air columns that ended up gripping the leg quite like the wedges in a lathe. Funding was provided by Queens, KGH, and private donors such as the War Amps. Uh, and really, the Q-Leg 
did surprisingly well in clinics. Patients were very accepting of it. They were very excited about it, uh, something that was new. The interesting thing about the Q-leg was that by standing on it and having your foot immen uh, immersed in this pressurized environment, it would keep pressure on the wound, which would actually speed up healing, and it would speed up the shrinking of the, uh, sp shrinking of the stump itself, which would get it faster to where you could be fitted with a good, normal prosthetic, permanent one. But the Q-leg had some problems. The plastic didn't breathe and people's stumps got hot underneath. The leg would often ride up on the patient's crotch. It would get caught on cupboards and it was uncomfortable during sleep. The greatest technical problem was that the seams just kept breaking and leaking. Unfortunately, 1980s material science had not caught up and copyright issues with the American company Jobs, who had the air boot, which was developed before the Q-Leg, but uh, the team was working in, in congruence with them. Uh, they started to get into copyright issues, and it was just dragging down funding and attention and everything. The final death knell is actually a little bit hilarious. All of their product was loaded onto a truck that was coming north of the border from where it was developed in the States, and somewhere along the way the truck caught fire and all the Q-Legs were lost. Um, <laughs> And that was the end of the project. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's an interesting project, and the reason I bring it up, I'll move over to this next one, which has two gentlemen who are wearing it. It was interesting because one of these men has been amputated below the knee, one above. It's, all prosthetics are quite difficult for someone who's transfemoral uh, amputated. Uh, they have less of a base for the prosthetic to grow, and it becomes a balancing issue. Um, most people needed the aid of a walker, and as you can see, the leg is quite huge. No wonder their boots were catching on the edges of cupboards. But the reason I bring up the Q-leg is that while some would call the project a failure, it really wasn't. Doctors and medical historians often focus on this constant upward march of incredibly progressive medicine, but they ignore the many pitfalls that come along the way. The Q-leg was met with incredible enthusiasm on the part of patients and hospitals and people providing funding. It got caught up in red tape, and the material science wasn't where it needed to be, and then the cu truck caught fire. <laughs> Maybe the truck won't catch fire next time. Maybe next time uh, we'll be able to create a better plastic seal. It's quite possible that just like other things in medicine, whether it's techniques or drug use, this might be put on the shelf for 30 years and picked up in the future. Perhaps there's someone in the room right now who might, 20 years from now, say, oh, remember that really smart research fellow? <laughs> and maybe this will become something that opens it up. But moving on to modern limbs, and like I said at the start, there's so many modern limbs that I'm going to be really, really brief on this because they've diversified so much. Myoelectric prostheses were developed post-50s. Uh, they use electromyography to sense electrical potentials when muscles in the residual limb contract. It controls a motorized robotic feature, such as a hand, a wrist, an elbow. The sea leg is quite interesting because it's a microprocessor-controlled knee which improves the gap between human senses and robotic response via thousands of calculations which take place every second. It's incredibly expensive, which is why it's mainly the rich and the military that have it. In fact, there's kind of a going thing that if you're a veteran of the military, you're going to get a sea leg. Uh, and it's quite interesting because it analyzes and smooths gait. Once calibrated, not only can it stand, walk, run, and climb stairs, but it can also predict and correct stumbles and it's incredibly safe. Some of the drawbacks is that the battery has to be charged overnight. However, a prototype knee brace was developed at Simon Fraser University, which uses regenerative braking, such as what's used in hybrid cars, and it can carry a five watt charge, which is enough to charge 10 cell phones. So, might become a little bit sustainable there. Targeted re is quite possibly one of the coolest and scariest things that's out there. What happens is that when a limb is amputated, say we cut off at the elbow, all of these nerve endings that are from the elbow up would be taken and moved onto the pectoral. Electrodes are set up there, and whenever you think I'm going to move my hand, it would still send that signal to these nerve endings which would cause part of your chest to contract. You're hooked up to a robotic shoulder girdle which is skin to skin contact there, it connects this, and at the speed of thought, the robotic arm responds. The really, really cool thing about targeted re is that it doesn't require implants and it uh, can pick up multiple EMGs individually. 
meaning that a limb can perform multiple functions. It's not so much arm up, arm down, as arm throw a ball. It has become an incredibly uh, advanced area of research and still continues to grow. Something that's quite cool since I've taken over the research here is that um, a lot of the work has been done on arms. Just about in April, I believe it was, a university in Boston started looking into if this was possible with legs. They hooked up the exact same thing. Nerves from below the knee were moved up to the stump above the knee. And uh, what they did was they hooked a girl up to a computer screen where she looked at an avatar and she just thought, move your leg up, move your leg down. She was able to do it. Lots of training, but she was able to do it. Now, the really cool thing was, though, that they suddenly realized that the avatar was moving its ankle, too. They never thought that they'd be able to recreate ankle motion. In fact, ankle motion has been something that's plagued uh, prosthetic development for so long. Suddenly, something they completely didn't expect might have us moving towards a fully bionic leg. One of the more scary things, osseointegration, which is developed between 1952 to the 80s by Swedish uh, surgeon Per Ingvar Brenmark, which was a dental procedure which is very, very popular today, where false teeth are attached by hypoallergenic titanium to residual bone, eventually started thinking, well, let's try this with legs. Uh, it presents a merger between the human and the machine because the bone is directly fastened to metal, meaning that the abutment, as you can see at the bottom there, it sticks directly out of the skin, <coughs> which is a little bit chilling. The successes of this is that it's very, 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 very stable. Uh, it restores sensory feedback. What I mean by that is that patients can actually feel where their foot is in space. They can feel the vibrations through it, and they gain back a sense of self. The drawbacks is that it's very time-consuming. It takes six months of you sitting, not putting any pressure on that, just to allow the bone to grow around the titanium implant. And even past that, it takes an intense 12 months of rehabilitation with at least three rehab sessions, several hours each, every week. It's a huge commitment, which is why it's only been done in clinical trials. It's very hard to find people that will commit to that and won't wash out of the program. Uh, high activity risks, falls and damage to the abutment and fractures to the bone, so you can't be a runner and have this but it is ideal for elderly candidates. It also requires vigilant hygiene because since the metal is sticking directly out of a partially open area in the skin, it's a source, uh, a site for infection. Um, also, it isn't uncommon to maybe pus a little. <laughs> Down here at the bottom, what I've got is cosmeses, which are silicone sheaths that cover a skeletal prosthetic, so you may have a prosthesis which is just a bone. This silicone base will be rolled down over top and it will mimic skin and sometimes even feels like skin. In fact, there are some people, uh, artists, who have come forward and said, we can build a better uh, cosmesis for you, and they actually will feel like skin and have hair follicles built into them. Anecdotal references to male versus female um, limbs is kind of interesting with cosmesis too because some patients, many of them military men, prefer the robotic exterior of their sea leg, while many m women will choose a more natural look, sometimes at the expense of function. For example, when I mentioned earlier the bridesmaid who had a plastic doll's hand, it looked incredibly, incredibly lifelike. Just like this woman reading here, you wouldn't be able to tell that that left arm is prosthetic unless you look at her elbow, where you can see the socket. These things can pass for normal, and because they are normal, quite, quite well. But uh, as I saw with this bridesmaid, um, she was still very self-aware of it. Every time uh, you'd come close to the table, she would grab her napkin and toss it over her elbow so you wouldn't notice. So there is still some kind of self-definition happening there. The Jai Per Foot is an interesting bit where prosthetics have joined with humanitarianism. The term is more a collective class. Um, and it's developed uh, in the bustling scooter city of Jaipur, India, where there were lots of people getting limbs amputated because they were getting hit by cars and scooters. You couldn't cross the street to say hi to your second cousin on the way back from temple without getting smacked by one. It's a handcrafted multiple axis limb, and it evokes the human foot exceptionally well in form and function, yet is cheaper than a pair of shoes because most people in uh, this part of India can't afford shoes to begin with, and they also lead a more barefoot lifestyle anyways. The foot is lightweight, rugged, waterproof, abrasion resistant, durable, and allows the wearer to squat, sit cross-legged, or go barefoot. And it's really quite perfect because it's a wet environment. There's monsoons. If you have someone who has a foot that has a partially foam bottom to it, it's going to wear away and it's going to need to be replaced within a year, maybe two. <coughs> this can last so long 
uh, and it's quite interesting because Dr. Pramod Karansethi, who is the quote unquote creator of it, uh, in 1966, really isn't actually the creator. He approached a lot of colleagues about it and unanimously they all agreed to forego any intellectual property rights. It is a limb that is designed by many people and yet on paper by none, meaning that this is perfect for developing nations. It requires little startup capital or large machinery. It uses locally available materials like wood or rubber. A non-literate artisan can fit amputees in less than an hour. The wearers need practically no training at all. And it's used in Nicaragua, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Kenya, and India. Dr. Sethi also won the Magsaysay Award in 1981 for this, and the Magsaysay is the Asian equivalent of the Nobel Prize, which is incredibly important for this and has sped up the, the uh, technology moving across the world to other areas in need. Some of the people who wear it include a celebrated dancer, uh, which we see here at the end, and you can tell that her bent knee on the ground is the one that has the prosthetic foot because the foot is taking a more unnatural thing, but she's a phenomenal dancer of huge uh, renown within India, both in dancing and now in acting and other things. In fact, there's an Indian version of So You Think You Can Dance that she's commanding. Uh, uh, there's a pro cricket player, the leader of the feared Tamil Tiger terrorist faction uses this, tree climbers, rickshaw drivers, farmers, and craftsmen. There's also non-human designs, which is just some photos to show, but we've got elephants, dolphins, dogs, and eagles, which all have different prosthetics. As well, we have some designers who take the fantastical and really run with it. Uh, my favorite being this tentacle arm here, which the big problem with prosthetics is that if you design something to grip, quite often it, there's no sense of touch. Well, there, there, there is no sense of touch, and so really you can't... Uh, tell when you're going to crush something. Holding a glass or an egg is incredibly dangerous. With this, uh, what it is is a coiled amount of plastic around a tube filled with some fluid. You pump up the fluid to as much as it needs and it only cur curls and coils around something to as much pressure as is necessary. So it allows a, a different way, but we'll see if people are ready for that at the mall, seeing someone walking around with their tentacle arm. Uh, down at the bottom is Amy Mullins, an incredibly important sprinter wearing cheetah running legs, which are carbon fiber blades, which are incredibly great at storing energy. In sports, things have become incredibly specialized. We've got running legs, swimming legs, cycling legs, hockey legs, organizations that seek equal opportunity, <laughs> such as Disabled Sports USA. And we've got the Paralympics, which starts in Rome in 1960 and offers today heroes and role models, as well as providing lucrative markets for programming-based design and advertising, just like the Olympics themselves. Two of the most pronounced athletes which I really gravitate to is, of course, Oscar Pistorius, the Blade Runner from South Africa, which many people have heard about. Uh, he's earned 12 medals, broken six world rec records with his Oscar flex foot cheetahs. And he's quite interesting because as, his, as he runs, studies have been done. They discover that he, he runs the 400 meter. He's one of the few people in the world who gets consecutively faster the longer he runs the race. Most people pass 200 meters and they start to slow down. He gains speed. The reason is that while the average human foot stores about 60% of the energy that's put into it, the cheetahs store 90%, which means he starts out the race incredibly slow, but he just keeps building energy and energy and energy, which is part of why he and other athletes perform very well with this. But the thing was he was performing so well that he expressed interest in joining the uh, Olympic race. And the IAAF, which is the governing body of the Olympics in the international sports world, basically said, well, yeah, sure, you can come up. And then they saw him getting fast and said, oh, crap. <laughs> and, uh, they decided that they were going to, in 2007, ban the use of any technical device that incorporates springs, wheels, or any other element that gives the user an advantage over another athlete not using such a device. This decision was based on a study of Pistorius' use of oxygen while running and was heavily criticized for flawed science. Allegations that he had an advantage were preposterous and discriminatory. He consumed the same amount of oxygen as the controls, and his stride, if anything, while well, people said, it has to be better, it has to be longer, his stride is actually two feet shorter than the average runner. <coughs> Add into that, like I said, he has incredibly short uh, start times, and the legs perform very poorly in wet conditions. Uh, it 
just was everything was going in his favor. Pistorius was quoted saying, I was running in able-bodied meets in high school, and I never saw the difference, and I still don't see the difference between the Paralympics and the Olympics today. I mean, it's a 400 meter race on the track. Same conditions, same preparation, and the same race tactics. I don't run harder in one or less than the other, or prepare more or less. The decision was overturned by the Court of Arbitration in Losang, and he's qualified. Oh, well, he is cleared to qualify for the 2012 Olympics in London, so it's quite possible that you could see this man very soon on your TV. Amy Mullins, uh, who has 12 pairs of legs, uh, has distinguished herself as a runner, actress, and model at collegiate and Paralympic events as a runner and a long jumper, and the end of this presentation will really start to focus on her because we get art and prosthetics. Now, Dickens in his literature was fascinated with amputees. They pop up all over the place, from Tiny Tim to practically anyone else. And in World War I, we see mass disfigurement, which starts the European surrealist artistic movement. This black and white collage, The Altar of the Fatherland by Max Ernst, expresses the blind patriotism and devotion that Imperial Germany demanded of its soldiers as this woman prays at an altar where there is a dismembered limb. But really, it's the modern art that captivated me, and it's really Amy Mullins that captivated me. Her exposure as an activist attracted her to the world of high fashion. The proud owner of 12 Legs, tw she's been twice the centerpiece of Matthew Barney's Cremaster Cycle 3 at the Guggenheim in New York, once standing on clear ceramic high-heeled legs, which accentuated the emptiness beneath her stumps, and once artistically outfitted as a cheetah, complete with clawed feet and a moving tail. She was up on a pedestal and actually surveyed everyone below her as inferior beings that she was the queen of the jungle over. Uh, Mullen's role in fashion has cultured this idea of being post-human. One can design the body to suit who one wants to be. Just like shoes, she has athletic legs, walking legs, incredibly lifelike legs. Uh, she has fancy legs and even artistic legs that blend the line between foot and shoe, such as her high-heeled wooden boot legs. The only difference is that she can decide how tall she wants to be, which some of her friends think isn't fair. <laughs> Ending off with Mullins, uh, a few years ago she was asked to write an article for Wired, and uh, she looked up disabled in the thesaurus. What she found was this. Disabled, adjective. Crippled, helpless, useless, wrecked. Stalled, maimed, wounded, mangled, lame, mutilated, run down, worn out. Weakened, impotent, castrated, paralyzed, handicapped, senile, decrepit, laid up, done up, done for, done in, cracked up, counted out. See also hurt, useless, weak, antonyms, healthy, strong, capable. A respected and successful amputee icon, she couldn't believe the emotional assault these words released on her. She says, I was born into a world that saw me as someone with nothing positive whatsoever going for them. But it's not the words that are the problem. It's the meaning that we put behind them and the labels that they construct. Our language affects our thinking, how we view the world and other people. So what reality do we really want to create? One of limitation or empowerment? Think of disabled children. By casually naming them, we limit their potential. Our responsibility is to inspire our children to face adversity and meet it well. We do a disservice to them when we tell them that they are not equipped to adapt. Words like that are the first brick in a wall that will eventually disable them. We all carry adversity with us, whether physical, emotional, or mental, but it is not some obstacle to get around so we can assume living. The question isn't how we meet, uh, when we meet adversity, but how. The medical model of what is broken, how do we fix it, has proven to be more disabling than the pathology itself. The only real consistent disability that Amy Mullins has ever had to deal with is that people ever thought she was disabled in the first place. The idea that she wants to put out there is not so much overcoming adversity, but rather opening yourself up to it, embracing it, grappling with it, maybe even dancing. And I'd like to end off with a five minute click from her TED talk at TED Med, which talks about overcoming adversity. I think the greatest adversity that we've created for ourselves is this idea of normalcy. But who's normal? There's no normal. There's common, there's typical, there's no normal. And would you want to meet that poor beige person if they existed? <laughs> I don't think so. If we can change this paradigm from one of a 
achieving normalcy, to one of possibility or potency, to be even a little bit more dangerous. We can release the power of so many more children and invite them to engage their rare and valuable abilities with the community. Anthropologists tell us that the one thing we as humans have always required of our community members is to be of use, to be able to contribute. There's evidence that Neanderthals 60,000 years ago carried their elderly and those with serious physical injury. And perhaps it's because the life experience of survival of these people proved of value to the community. They didn't view these people as broken and useless. They were seen as rare and valuable. A few years ago, I was in a food market in the town where I grew up, in that red zone in northeastern Pennsylvania. And I was standing over a bushel of tomatoes. It was summertime. I had shorts on. I hear this guy, his voice behind me say, well, if it isn't Amy Mullins, and I turn around, and it's this older man. I have no idea who he is. And I said, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't have we met? I, I don't remember meeting you. He said, well, you wouldn't remember meeting me. I mean, when we met, I was delivering you from your mother's womb. <laughs> oh, that guy. <laughs> and of course, actually, it did click. This man was Dr. Keene, a man that I had only known about through my mother's stories of that day. Because, of course, typical fashion, I arrived late for my birthday by two weeks. And so my mother's prenatal physician had gone on vacation. So the man who delivered me was a complete stranger to my parents. And because I was born without the fibula bones and had feet turned in and a few toes in this foot and a few toes in that, he had to be the bearer, the stranger had to be the bearer of bad news. He said to me, I had to give this prognosis to your parents that you would never walk and you would never have the kind of mobility that other kids have or any kind of life of independence, and you've been making a liar out of me ever since. <laughs> the extraordinary thing is that he said he had saved newspaper clippings throughout my whole childhood, whether winning a second grade spelling bee, marching with the Girl Scouts, and, you know, the Halloween parade, winning my college scholarship, or any of my sports victories. And he was using it and integrating it into teaching uh, resident students, med students from Hahnemann Medical School and Hershey Medical School. And he called this part of the course the X Factor. And it was the potential of the human will. No prognosis can account for how powerful this could be in the de as a determinant in the quality of someone's life. And Dr. Keene went on to tell me that he said, in my experience, unless repeatedly told otherwise, and even if given a modicum of support, if left to their own devices, a child will achieve. See, Dr. Keene made that shift in thinking. He understood that there's a difference between the medical condition and what someone might do with it. What Mullins ends off saying is, we look at children and what they're told, what they can achieve with what abilities or disabilities they have. There was a study that was done within the UK where a group of students were taken uh, with their teachers and they were, told the, they were told that this is the group of students who are A-level performers and these are the Ds, and then they switched them. And the A's became the Ds and the Ds became the A's. And the amazing thing was that the A's uh, th these former low-achieving students suddenly were performing so well. Their grades were coming up. They were engaging more. They were becoming more sociable. Now the problem is that the former high-achieving students were flunking out. They were performing incredibly terribly and horrible effects were given to them that could take a lifetime or maybe never to undo. And the even more painful thing is that the teachers were duped too the teachers were told that these are the A's and these are the D's. And so that's how they tailored their teaching. They didn't put as much effort maybe into the D's as they did the A's, or they taught them in a different way, or they just wrote them off. 
And it's very much that same way with people with disabilities, and especially children with disabilities. We need to be able to cultivate this society where our children who are differently abled and our adults who are differently abled feel like they have a voice and feel like they can achieve. Not because adversity is something that has to be overcome, but because adversity, like our shadow, is something that's always there. Also like our shadow, it depends on how you look at it. It's all in perception. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.